everybody. As introduced, I'm Lerato, and I have the privilege of reading um, from the book of Acts for us today. So if you have your Bible with you, please turn to the book of Acts, chapter 13. And we're going to read from verse 38 to 52. <laughs> and it reads, Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Everyone who believes is justified through him from everything that could not be justified from the law of Moses. So beware that, oh, so beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. And this is what's said. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away because I am doing a work in your days. A work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. So Paul and Barnabas in Antioch, as they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about the matters of the, of the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts of Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the, gra in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first. Since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we are turning to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord, and all, all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But Paul, oh, yeah, but Paul and Barnabas shook the dust off their feet against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Look, fam, let's be honest. It's been a phenomenal morning so far. Look, I get a really, really great feeling when the Springboks win. And then, when I gather with my brothers and sisters and we baptize people and we sing the way we did, I amplify that by 10. It's been great. So we've been well hosted by Kuliso. Thank you so much, mate. We were well led by Jake and the worship ministry. Thank you to them. We were well read by Lerato. I made a little dad joke there. It could also qualify as a pastor's joke. Thank you for not laughing. It was a little bit lame. Uh, Lerato, I don't know why you always get the big teaching texts. The first time she read, she read Psalm 42 and 43 all at once. But you nailed it. Thank you so much. I'm excited to open up God's word with you. Before we do that, let's pray. Lord Jesus, you have become bigger in our eyes, in our minds, and in our hearts as we have gathered this morning, as we've sung about your love, your sacrifice, the fact that you were a substitute for our salvation, as we saw people being baptized, as we were encouraged once again to stay the course, to stay committed and faithful to you. Now we want to hear from you as we open your word. Thank you that we can do it in the setting. Thank you for the book of Acts. Thank you that we can get back into it. I pray, Lord Jesus, that we would see that we are on mission, that we would see that that mission glorifies you, and that that mission brings kingdom and wholeness to this broken and dark world. May your name be glorified as we open up your word. Illuminate our hearts and minds. We pray that in your name. Amen. Amen. So, fam, we're back in the book of Acts. The last time we were in the book of Acts was on the 31st of July of 2022. So, if you can't remember it, it's quite okay. Some of y'all weren't even here then. So, let's just, let me bring you back up to speed. We are going to look at a whole series of slides. And the purpose of these slides are to just bring you back into the story. So here we go. First one. The book of Acts is written by Luke. It's a unified two-volume work which includes the Gospel of Luke and Acts. Luke was a doctor. He was a traveling co-worker with Paul. And you'll see how he starts the book. We're going to read that now as well. I produced my first account about all the things that Jesus began to do and teach 
And then the implication for the book of Acts is that it, this is about what Jesus continued to do and teach. Okay, so began to do and teach, continued to do and teach. I love the Bible Project. They say this, if we can look at the next slide. They say that classically the book has been called uh, the Acts of the Apostles, but a more accurate name actually would be the Acts of Jesus and the Spirit through the Apostles. Because that's exactly what happened. Jesus continued the work through his Apostles by pouring out his Spirit on them. Let's look at the next one. This is what the book of Acts, well, Luke Acts, is actually all about. How God's kingdom came on earth as in heaven through Jesus and His Spirit and His church. That's a really good summary of both books. And then you'll see that in these two books we find examples of faithfulness to King Jesus. Okay, it's written as follows. Sharing the good news in word and action, that's being faithful to King Jesus. Forming diverse communities where people are equals, that's examples of faithfulness to King Jesus. And then the third one, trusting in the power and guidance of the Spirit, is also another example of faithfulness to King Jesus. Now, just look at it. Isn't that what you want? Isn't that what all of us want? Isn't this what we want to see in our church? I do. Well, let me ask it a different way. How faithful are you to King Jesus if you measure yourself against these three things? Is your life filled with these three things? Even if it is, we still have some way to go. And that's why we need to get back into this book. And that's why we need to learn what this book has to say to us. Now, if you are here today and you are not a Christian, let me just say that what we're going to see today is, a, well, actually these three things, is a really good summary of what ought to happen to you when you surrender your life to Jesus. That often happens when people say, look, I'm interested in Christianity, but I don't believe yet. One of the things they want to know is what's going to happen to me if I believe that. That's going to happen to you if you believe. And it's awesome. And it's a great adventure. So there's a good summary for you of what it means to be a Christian. Now today's teaching text started close to the middle of the book, in the middle of a sermon by Paul. So before we can dive in, we need to pick up the story. Are you guys with me? Now, stay with me because we are going to fly through the story. Okay, next slide. Here's what I want you to see. Introduction, Hala has it. A whole collection of events in Jerusalem. A whole collection of events in Judea and Samaria. And now we are here, the missionary journeys of Paul. And eventually the book ends with Paul's witness in Rome. So this will be Acts season three for us, here in the low felt. I'm joking, I made a, I made a weatherman joke. Okay, so that's where we headed for the whole of season 3, chapters 13 to 20. Next thing that I want to show you is we have a discipleship journey at Fellowship City. We say this is what a disciple does. A disciple loves God and loves people. We say a disciple knows God, commits faithfully and gives generously. And then we unpack with three really easy dashes uh, what that means. Today's sermon will lead us here. A disciple loves God and loves people commits faithfully to transformation. This is now personal transformation into the image of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And definitely a disciple commits faithfully to the mission of the church. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Our own transformation and the mission of the church and how we should commit faithfully to it to, in order to love God and love people and be His disciples. Okay, let's go. Acts chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus. About all the things uh, Jesus, sorry, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, that's important, that was part one of the story. He also presented himself alive, that's how the first part of the story ended, to them by many convincing proofs. Theophilus, this isn't a fairy tale, it's a real story, it's a fact appearing to them over a period of 40 days, and here's what he had to say. He spoke about the kingdom of God. Cool. Then in 1 verse 8, it says, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, 
and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So Jesus is alive. He tells his apostles what to do. They need to wait because something will happen to them. And when that thing happens to them, there will be witnesses. There will be witnesses everywhere. And there will be witnesses of the kingdom of God. So did it happen? Yes. Here we go. Acts chapter 2. Verse 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, historical time stamp, time and place and day, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were staying. They saw tongues like flames of fire that separated and rested on each one of them. Then they were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different tongues as the Spirit enabled them. I don't know if you guys ever had this song at athletics at school. We've got the spirit. Yes, we do. We've got the spirit. How about you? We've got the spirit. So the book says, okay, important ingredient in the narrative of this book. And then something happened. Look at chapter 2, 41 to 42. So those who accepted his message, right? So Peter gets up, Peter starts preaching. They were baptized and that day, about 3,000 people were added to them. Boom! There we go. The first growth of the church was quite exponential. From 120 to 3,000. And here's what they did. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. A learning community, getting together, reminding themselves of what Jesus did on the cross, and praying. Where? In Jerusalem. So remember, we said Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that's Jerusalem. Now, in chapter 8, we see the story turn, and now we are headed to Samaria. Read it with me. Saul agreed with putting him to death. Okay, hang on, hang on, hang on. Who's him? Stephen. Stephen is preaching in Jerusalem. People don't like what they hear, even though he is speaking the truth. And Stephen is also showing that the whole of the Old Testament leads to Jesus as one unified story. The religious leaders don't like what they hear. And Saul says, kill him. And then it says, on that day, a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. Okay, bad way how they got there because it was through persecution, but they had to go there anyway after Jerusalem. So their persecution now leads to the spread of the gospel. Saul, however, it says, was ravaging the church. He would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. Saul poses a problem to the church. The church is now scattered. The church carries this message, the church has the Spirit, and the church operates in the power of the Spirit. Paul will have none of it. Well, Saul still uh, in this part of Acts. Look at chapter 9, verse 3 to 6. As he traveled, because he wanted to catch Christians, and was nearing Damascus, that's to the northern part of Israel, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? Saul said. I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Okay, wait, wait. Jesus is dead, according to Saul. But Jesus is not, according to the church. So how did Paul start, Saul, how did he start believing that Jesus was alive? Because the resurrected Jesus, the exalted Jesus, appeared to him. So there's proof that he does live. And then Paul goes, oh, snap. He doesn't even say anything. Look at verse 6. Get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. I left that verse in there because do you know how life change happened for Paul? He obeyed right away. Do you see that? He absolutely hates Jesus and the church. Then he meets Jesus, and Jesus goes, okay, here's your first assignment. Go into the city. And Paul goes, I'm going to do that. And that's where his whole journey starts. It's amazing, huh? Do you ever think about yourself and your discipleship journey in that way? If Jesus says something, do it. Obey right away. 
Okay, so now Paul goes into the city. Look at chapter 9, verse 10. There was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision. I love this. Here comes a vision from the Lord. And what is he going to say? Ananias. <laughs> Just that. Ananias. <laughs> and Ananias goes, Here I am, Lord. He replied. Now Jesus exercises his authority and says, Get up and go to the street called Straight. The Lord said to him, To the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so that he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Look, I'm not sure what Ananias' intention was, but he was scared. And I would have been too. So I think he was just sussing out. Okay, <laughs> Jesus, what exactly is it that you want me to do? Do you want me to go and get willfully arrested? Because that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. I'll do it. I just want to check with you, you know. And then Jesus answers him, Go, for this man is my chosen instrument to take my name to Gentiles, kings, and Israelites. A murderer who loved watching how someone gets killed with stones thrown against their heads. Someone who did not believe in Jesus. Someone who actively persecuted Jesus. Someone who hated his people. That person is my chosen instrument. Fam, we need to hear this. Because if I say, Paul writes in Ephesians, we all have this picture of Paul was like the deputy president. You know what I mean? He's got PhDs and honorary doctorates and he knows everything about everything and he's such a nice guy. He wasn't a very nice guy. But still, Jesus chose him. And he chose him for a very specific purpose. That's why I highlighted it, to take my name to Gentiles, kings and Israelites. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. That's an important cue. He wasn't called for holiday. He was called for suffering. And Ananias went and entered the house. Yes, obedience. He placed his hands on him and said, I like this, Brother Saul. I think that was just kind of to soften the, the tension. <laughs> you know, instead of going, Saul, and being beaten, he went, <clears throat> Eta. He just kind of tested the waters. And then went, uh, but, but, but brother Saul, yeah, it seems congenial, it seems good. The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once, something like scales fell from his eyes, he regained his sight, and then he got up and was baptized. And after so taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul's back, but he's a completely different person. Why? Because he's now filled with the Holy Spirit and he's marked with water as one of Jesus's. Now he has a calling. Now he has a mission. He has a word spoken over him, which will also be confirmed later in the book. Everything changes for Paul. This is important for us if we talk about what it means to surrender your life to Jesus. Surrendering your life to Jesus can't mean I was headed in this direction. I added Jesus as a passenger in my car, and I'm still headed in this direction. If you surrender your life to Jesus, everything changes about everything, because now he's the Lord of everything. And then he gets to call the shots. Paul is a very important example of this. Okay, look at Acts 9.31. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit... It increased in numbers. It's a very convicting line for me. So obviously, praise God for the little bit of peace that they did have. But then I think, if someone would go on Fellowship City's Instagram, would they say, ooh, this is a church where people live in the fear of the Lord. This is a church where people are encouraged by the Holy Spirit. And because this church's people are encouraged by the Holy Spirit, and because they live in the fear of the Lord, it increases in numbers. 
I think that's a phenomenal measure to use. Instead of, this church looks like it's got really good music and great food and a nice space and a good kids ministry, and therefore they are increasing in numbers. That's not what the church in Acts were known for. This is what they were known for. Okay, now, something happens to Peter, okay? While Peter was still speaking, look at Acts chapter 10. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. Okay, hang on, hang on. on. Peter gets sent to the house of a Gentile because the good news needs to keep on spreading. Peter is reluctant at first. Jesus convinces him by showing him a vision, and then he preaches. Okay? Now, people who, according to Peter, should not have heard the good news, now they hear the good news. And it says, while he was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. Holy Spirit again. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Everyone gets to be part of this, and we don't get to decide who. Do you see that? Because Peter said in the beginning, no, 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 no. And then Jesus convinced him. And then he was like, okay, okay, okay that's cool. I'll go. And then he speaks. And then Jesus decides to pour the Spirit out on these people. And then they are amazed. For they heard them speaking in tongues and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, can anyone withhold water and, pre and prevent these people from being baptized? Who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. He commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then they asked him to stay for a few days. The good news is spreading. And it's spreading to everyone. And the apostles posture according to the mission that Jesus has given them is. Who are we to decide? Have you ever pondered that question? Who are we to decide who gets in and who doesn't? Who are we to decide who gets to hear the good news and who doesn't? We can't. That's why the Great Commission says, go to all nations and keep on speaking and keep on proclaiming. It also doesn't say that you have to bring the conviction. It also doesn't say that you get to decide when you pour out the Holy Spirit. It just says, do what I tell you to do. Now the church is growing. Acts chapter 11. Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution, do you guys remember Acts chapter 8? that started because of Stephen, made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. So even though the Spirit was poured out on people who were not Jews, the people who were carrying this message wasn't sure if, they, if those boundaries have been broadened. But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. Who gave them the permission to do so? The Spirit. And then they did it. They weren't sure if they should, but they did. And, look at it, the Lord's hand was with them. And a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged of them to so, sorry and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and large numbers of people who were added to the Lord. Isn't that great? Barnabas goes to Antioch and he goes, Epic! Look what Jesus is doing here. Hey, listen, will, will you go and get Paul for me, please? We need to do some work here. We need to do some teaching and encouraging here. Isn't that great? Verse 25. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year, they met with the church and taught large numbers. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Do you actually know this verse in the book of Acts? It's quite cool. This is the first time where they were called people who carry Christ. People who look like Christ. Little Christs. A group of Jesuses, Christians, that's who these people are. Now, in Acts chapter 12, it says, About that time, King Herod violently attacked some who belonged to the church, and he executed James, John's brother, with the sword. This is bad news. 
And it poses a real problem for the church. Because the church is doing well, but now persecution is also stepping up. And James, if you guys watch The Chosen, he's the one called Big James. He was the first one to be executed. Now Herod, it says in verse 3, when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too, during the festival of unleavened bread. So persecution starts. It's not only Big James, but but now it's Peter. Apologies for the fact that I called him Big James. That's a fictitious name from the chosen. My bad, James. Okay? Actually, Jacob, but we can go into that a little bit later. Then, verse 24 and 25, this is where we ended, Acts season 2. But the word of God spread and multiplied. And after they had completed their relief mission, Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem, taking along John, who was called Mark. Does that ring a bell? It's the same guy that wrote the gospel, according to Mark. Okay. Then in the beginning of chapter 13, it says, Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was also called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a close friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. So I highlighted Barnabas and Saul because they are currently in Antioch. As they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. In our teaching text, Paul recalls the work which uh, they were called to. Then after they had fasted, prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Do you guys see the story? Jerusalem first, then Judea and Samaria, and where are we going now? To the ends of the earth. And then they were sent off in verse 3. So today's theme is, let's go. That's exactly what they did. They were like, okay, on to the next one. Boom. Let's go. And they embark on their first missionary journey. Now in one chapter, we see three stops. And I just decided that I can only preach through one of the stops for today. But let me show you the three stops at least. So they stop in Cyprus. You can take a picture of this if you want to. It's like a cheat sheet for understanding Acts chapter 13. So they stop in Cyprus first. And there you'll see some people will be open to God's word. Some people will oppose God's word. And some people will embrace God's word. That's what we learn. Then they stop in Perga. Uh, and in those two really short verses we learn... That you should be ready for relational conflicts within your ministry team. There's a little bit of tension about John Mark. And you should also see that you should be ready for physical challenges as you make the gospel known. Right? So they go to Perga, and then from there they do 160 kilometers by foot over mountains. How does that sound to you? Oftentimes when you go on a short-term outreach, you roll in there in an aircon bus. And then you stay in a lodge with aircon where you can switch on a light as you try and minister to people. Not these guys. These guys were roughing it out. Why? Because that's what the Spirit expected of them. This is what they were called for. And then the third stop is in Pisidian Antioch, and this is where our teaching text is. And then you'll see, I think the two big takeaways is proclaim Christ in a way that is suitable for your audience. Paul speaks in a synagogue to people who know the Old Testament. And he goes, hey, let's start there. I know the Old Testament and you know the Old Testament. I know what synagogue is like and you know what synagogue is like. So let me enter into your space and then talk to you about the stuff you already know and then show you how that all points to Jesus. That's Paul's strategy. It's brilliant. And then the second thing you'll see is that you do get a mixed reaction. And I'm saying this to you now because I would want us to always be encouraged to share the gospel with people regardless of their reaction. I think this is a lie that the enemy whispers to us when we share the gospel with people and then they don't accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Then the enemy goes, you are a very poor preacher. You should never try that again. And then you talk about all things except the good news. Okay, so now, taking everything into, the, into account in the first two stops, what do you do? Think about it. If you went through all of the things that they went through in Cyprus and in Perga, what do you do? According to Paul and Barnabas, they kept going. It's very encouraging to read their story. They are great models of how to be on mission. They are worthy of following. Okay, so I have four remarks from the teaching text. Not four points, four remarks, and we'll be done. 
How can we go and continue the work? Right, so a theme for today, let's go. That's what Paul and Barnabas did. That's what we ought to do. We are embarking on Acts season 3. How can we go and continue the work? Four things. Stick to the good news. It is sufficient. Know the work and testify about it. Be consistent and committed. And fourth one, stay the course and keep your head up. Keep your head up in this sense doesn't mean like walk proudly. It means look for where God is busy working. Keep your head up. Okay, let's look at the first one. Stick to the good news. It is sufficient. Just two verses and I made some highlights for you. So chapter 13 verse 38 starts with, Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers and sisters, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. Okay, so you should always ask what the therefore is there for. So Paul was busy unpacking the story of the Old Testament. Hey, this is a nice cheat remark for you. If you struggle to hold together the whole story of the Old Testament, just read all the sermons in the book of Acts. Because so many of them summarize the story of the Old Testament. Start with creation. Starts with the promise. Starts with sin and rebellion. Starts with kings. Starts with prophets. And then in the end says... What God's people have always wanted and what the prophets hoped for and what the nation of Israel couldn't deliver was a Savior. Ta-da! And His name is Jesus Christ. And then they start talking about the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension and the return of Jesus Christ. That's the recipe. That's how the people in Acts wrote sermons. So if you struggle to know the full story of the Old Testament, just go and read like Acts chapter 13. So he says... Talks through the whole story of the Old Testament and then he says, Therefore, after everything I just said, you guys know that we long for a Savior. You guys know that we long for someone who can pay in a way that satisfies. You guys know that we are looking for forgiveness of sins. I am telling you, through this man, this forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed. Okay, so what do we do? Verse 39, everyone who believes. Fam, it's important for us to remember how easy it is. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that He was raised from the dead, you will be saved. Is it as simple as that? Yes, it is. Why? Because He wants you. And He knows that we can't do it on our own. Not a single human being could ever qualify for salvation or reconciliation with God. That's why Jesus came to pay the price. And then he says, if you believe this, you are justified through him from everything that you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. I have said this before, but let me say it again. The word justifies, oh, justified means justified, never sinned. That's what justifies Justified means. It's a, it's a legal standing. It's a status you have. So because Jesus paid for our sins, when I believe in Him, I am justified. And it's justified, never sinned. Never! Think about that. All of it, gone. Paid. By grace, through faith. That is the good news. And no one could ever do it on their own. No one can do it today. So whoever you witness to, and whatever objection they have, ask them, how will you make sure that you are living without sin? How, how will you make sure that you can appear before a holy and just God? Because I can't. And through the law of Moses, you could bring a sacrifice, and then just for a little short while, it was just as if I'd, you'd never sinned. And then you walk out of the temple, you say a cutting word to someone, and you go, Oh, no! Ah, bring them two doves. I have to go back again. Because I sinned. We could never pay. We could never pay enough. But Jesus could. So that's how we go and continue the work. We stick to the good news. It is sufficient. Do not be led to believe that we should dish up something that sounds cool in cultural Gen Z slang. You don't have to be able to make good reels about it. 
You don't have to be able to make it compete with Game of Thrones. Just share the gospel and talk to people about a loving God that wants to be in a relationship with Him and that made a way so that we can do it and tell them that it just happens through belief. Free. It's sufficient. And I think we might have forgotten this. Many clever ways to share the gospel. The three S's. Jesus suffered as a substitute for our salvation. The three R's. We repent, we receive, and we remember. You can go the gift of faith, the grip of faith by a leap of faith. You can go ABC, admit your sins, believe in Jesus, and confess Him as your Lord and Savior. Many, many ways in which you can share it. Hey, I don't know if you guys remember the Evangi Cube. It's quite cool. It's an instrument that you use to share the gospel if you can't speak a common language. My very first sermon was at a cattle hold in New Kade in Botswana to Bushman people using the Evangi Cube. And they got it. It was unbelievable because it was pictures. It's a cube that you fold and then you explain by showing to the elements and showing to the pictures. It was awesome. I did have a, a translator. I didn't know what he told them, but I do believe that he told them what I told them. It's great. So there are many clever ways to do it. You don't have to have a PhD. Stick to the good news. Second one. Know the work and testify about it. Now look, Paul has got a, he's got a, um, he's got a warning here. Beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Okay, so he quotes Habakkuk. Habakkuk, Habakkuk, say it however you want, right? The Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. So he quotes Habakkuk and he says, listen, back in the day, there were people who knew what God was busy with, but they didn't believe. Don't be like that. And then he quotes and says, look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away, because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. Okay, so I already spoke about a loving God wanting to be in a relationship with us and sending His Son. Okay, so that part of the gospel I have covered. Let's just focus on the middle highlight. I am doing a work in your days. What is the work that God is doing in our day? We need to know this. And we need to be able to talk about it. And we need to share that with people. Check this, check this, check this. The work that Jesus is currently doing is not getting more and more people into a church building on a Sunday so that they can sing songs together, listen to someone give a speech, then give their money, and then go home and feel better about themselves. That's not the work that Jesus is busy with. Jesus is busy bringing His kingdom about here on earth. He's busy reigning as King. Through His people who He gave the Holy Spirit to, who He calls His family, and through who He renews all things. Jesus is busy with the great work of restoration. Jesus is busy fixing what was broken in the beginning. He's busy making good on His promises that eventually it will all end in redemption and restoration. And we are part of that story. Jesus takes us from death to life, from darkness to light, from selfishness to service. Jesus changes us inside out. Jesus transforms us in a way that I am not the same tomorrow that I was today. And I'm not the same guy that I was 19 years ago. And I'm being formed into His image. And my life is bearing fruit. And through my life bearing fruit, I'm salt. And I'm light to the world. And I'm a body moving to the world, to all the broken people and all the excluded people, calling them back to the bosom of the Father. That's the work. That's what you should experience. That's what you are a part of. And that is what people shouldn't miss. Because if you share with people, hey, hey, our church is really great. Man, we've got some good coffee, I'm telling you. <laughs> and the music, yeah, solid. Who's going to say yes to that? That's not the work that God is doing. Tell people about what you see in the church. Tell people about what you hear people sing and pray. Tell people about what you sing and what you pray and what you read and what you hear. Tell people about how the Spirit is transforming you. Tell people about how the Spirit sends you to broken people. And then tell them, don't miss it. Because you can be part of it. 
The global church is part of it. God is literally calling all people across the globe back to Him. And He will not come back until every single person has heard the good news. He said that in Matthew 24. That's why we're still here. I mean, every now and then I go, Jesus, today would be a phenomenal day to come back. Just do it. Like, I'm ready. My wife's ready. Kids are ready. Let's go. All in. And then I hear the Spirit go, yeah, but there's people who don't know. And then I go, okay, well, show me. Show me where are those people so that I can tell them so that you can come back. So that their lives can also be made whole. Know the work and testify about it. I've said this before. Testify doesn't mean proof by scientific fact. Testify just means tell us what happened. Hey, if you get called to a court, was there a car accident on the, call of Van, ach, on the corner of Van Reineveld and Solomon Marslangu? Well, Solomon Marslangu Drive. Google Maps. Was there an accident or wasn't there? Yes. Okay, what happened? And then you just tell your story. Thank you for witnessing. Okay, cheers. You didn't have to prove anything. Just say, this is what happened. And that's how witness for us as Christians happen. Third one. How can we go and continue the work? Be consistent and committed. Look at this. As they were leaving, the people urged them to speak about these matters the following Sabbath. Please come back. Can we talk again? I love what you said. That's what it says. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout converts to Judaism followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and urging them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath, as they asked, almost the whole town assembled to hear the word of the Lord. And then when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying, insulting him. And then Paul and Barnabas boldly replied, It was necessary that the word of God be spoken to you first, since you reject it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life. We are turning to the Gentiles. We are here to do a work. We told you what we are here to do. And if you want to know more, you know where to find us. And when you find us, we'll keep on speaking to you. Fam, we need to be committed and consistent when we share the gospel with people. Check this. This is my cheat sheet. If someone talks to you about something, just think about the random neighbor interaction. And they just told you, uh, I just came back from Unitas. My mom is in high care because she had a stent put into her chest and I'm quite anxious about it. Remember it. Write it down. And write the mom's name down and write the neighbor's name down. Fam, I promise you, if you pray for someone, you don't forget their names. And then you stir up another conversation and go, Hey, sup, just checking in. How's your mom? Don't ever ask someone, how's your mother, if you don't know them, okay? How's your mom? And how are you guys feeling? And how can I serve you? If someone says, can we talk again? Write it down. And then pray for them. And then send them a text. Hey, checking in. How's it? Firstly. And secondly, uh, I'm still keen for a coffee. Whenever you are. Just saying. That's my secret weapon to getting into gospel conversations. Because then people go, oh, really? I thought he just said, hey, we should have coffee sometime. But now I'm writing it to them again. And then also be committed. Don't change your tune. Don't change what you're talking about. That's why I highlighted boldly replied in verse 46. It was clear to everyone what Paul and Barnabas were about. It should be clear to us what we are about. Okay? Think about this. Why would someone be angry with you if you are concerned for them and where they are going to spend eternity? Just think about that. If you live in a, in a place where your neighbor goes, Hey... Uh, your car's headlights are on, then you message them back and you go, ah, oh, that's so sweet, thank you so much for caring for me, I really appreciate that. So we appreciate something like, my car battery won't run flat. If you tell someone that you are concerned for where they'll spend eternity, because you do believe that there's a heaven and a hell, and you want them to be in heaven, and you've got some really good news for them, because they can get into heaven, and have their lives transformed, who would go, I can't believe that you would want that for me. That is the worst idea I ever heard of. No one will ever say it. So we don't have to be secretive about it. We can just be open about it. I would love to talk to you about Jesus. And I'm keen to do it whenever you can. Will you tune me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Can I take down your name and number? Yeah, sure. 
fourth one. And I'm going to finish with this. How can we go and continue the work? Stay the course and keep your head up. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. They said, I've made you a light for the Gentiles to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. We know what we're called to do. That's what we're busy with. We're not going to change our tune. We're going to keep going. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and honored the word of the Lord. All who have been appointed to eternal life, sorry, and all who have been appointed to eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region. That's great news. But the Jews incited the prominent God-fearing women and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But Paul and Barnabas shook the dust of their feet against them and went to Iconium. Look, it would have been awesome if the whole city came to faith. But they didn't. So what did they do? They didn't say, ah, oh, snap, this is a tough place with hard soil. Let's change our worship style. I think that'll work. Let's change the time of the service. Maybe we should have something that's appealing to the kids. None of that. They were like, okay, on to the next one. Iconium. Here we go. Dust off their feet. Let's keep going. Why? Verse 52. The disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. That's how you stay the course and you keep your head up. You're filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And you continue the work that you've been called to. And that's what we've been called to. Great story, isn't it? Amen. We are now going to respond in song. I just want you to, to consider these four things. The first one would be sticking to the good news and believing that it's sufficient. Maybe that's your response today. Maybe your response today is, I need to really put my faith in this thing. I need to put my full weight in this. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. But Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's how mathematics work according to the gospel. Maybe that's your response, is to say, I'm going to put my full faith in this message and not believe in any add-ons. I'm also not going to try and share any add-ons. There's one thing, and that's the message of the cross and the resurrection. Maybe that's your response. It's just re-appreciating the good news. I've said this to you guys before, but let me say it again. I, Rainer Meyer, as a disciple of Jesus, not a pastor of a church, need to preach the good news to myself every single day. And I listen to a sermon of someone else every single day telling me who I am because of what Jesus did on the cross. Every single day. I can't go a day without it. And if I try and do that, let me tell you about the worst day of my week. Because then I try and operate on my own power. I play according to a different audience and crowd. We play to an audience of one, and that's Jesus the Lord. Number two, know the work and testify about it. Maybe a good response for you today would be, let me just write down how I have been transformed. Let me just write down how I've seen God move in, the, in my life and in the life of others. Let me write down just what I saw here today as a transcultural church celebrated the baptism of people. And let me think how that fits into the great mission of God in the world. And let me share that story. Imagine if you walk out here and someone goes, so, how was church today? And you go, I'm so glad you asked. It was epic. Do you know what happened? This is what happened and this is what I saw. And I praise God for the work that he's currently doing in our church. That'll be a far better response than, it was all right. It's kind of hot in the building, I have to say. Very sweaty. Very humid. Maybe that's your response. Be consistent and committed, fam. Look, not rebuking, just encouraging. Maybe you need to make a call. Maybe you need to send someone a WhatsApp. Maybe there's a follow-up conversation that you need to have that you haven't had. Maybe there's just someone that you need to check in with that you haven't checked in with for quite some time. No one loathes or hates a check-in. Maybe that's your response, is to go, Holy Spirit, you have showed me that I need to send person X or WhatsApp. I'm going to do it now, before I get into the car. Because when you get into the car, your car's going to be hot, and then you're not going to send the WhatsApp because you're going to be hot and bothered. So do it outside the car and then get into the hot car. But do it now. Obey right away. And the fourth one, stay the course and keep your head up. Maybe. A good response for you today would just be to ask the Holy Spirit, will you show me where you are busy working at the moment? 
Will you show me where I need to go next and who I need to talk to next? Will you open my eyes to the person in my complex or in my office building or the parent next to the sport field or my family member that needs to hear the gospel? Open up my eyes. Show me Iconium because I'm ready to go. Maybe that's, maybe that's your response today. And then lastly, let me just say, if you want to put your full faith into Jesus and you want to confess Him with your mouth and you want to believe in your heart, we always have opportunity to do so. We don't make a spectacle of it because it's your salvation. And you are going to come from darkness to light, from death to life. It's going to be awesome. So if that's your prayer, and you say, Lord Jesus, I admit all my sin. I believe that you paid for it all, and I confess you as my Lord and Savior. Will you please tell us? We would love to hear that. We've got some people on our prayer benches. And I love it when people go, uh, I surrendered my life to Christ. What do I do now? It's great. Gladys and I had a moment like that not too long ago. She walks by and she goes, those two people surrendered their lives to Christ. High five, high five, let me go home. Brilliant. That's the way the church works. I want to give you an opportunity to do that too. Let's pray. Oh, Lord Jesus, we marvel and we are amazed at the good news. Thank you for paying the price so that our sins could be forgiven so that we can be deemed justified. Thank you that all you ask is a leap of faith, belief in what you did for us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that that message pierces our hearts and enriches our spirits every single day. And thank you that we can trust you to do exactly that to everyone who we share this this marvelous truth with. Do a work in us now, Holy Spirit. You know what each of our responses are. You know exactly what we need. We believe, as Paul wrote in Philippians 1, that you will complete the work that you started in us. So work hard now, Holy Spirit, as we respond. Keep us faithful. Keep us committed. Keep us focused on the gospel. Help us to know the work that you do. Help us to testify about the work you do. Show us where and who is next. We want to see the church grow as it did in the book of Acts. For your glory and for the completion of your mission. Here we are, Lord Jesus. Ready to go like Barnabas and Paul. Send us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.